So the whole question arises, how are we going to build a nationwide system of drought and flood control, complete re-innovation re of, our, of our power grid, uh, enough nuclear power plants to provide uh, efficient trans electricity, not only for current needs, but for a huge industrial uh, cement, copper, aluminum mills, uh, the new power plants, all the, the drilling, rolling, forging, canal digging, tunnel boring, drilling, uh, reservoir building, pumping, all of this, how, how are we going to get that much electricity? And how are you going to pay for it, right? That's what everybody says to me in every single meeting uh, whenever you start to get into the good stuff. They say, I like the idea, but how are you going to pay for it? Um, I like the idea, but where are you going to get the money? Well, the whole thing is it has nothing to do with money at all. Uh, and this country was not founded on money, and we don't need money. Uh, all we need is our own commitment to do the job. Another word for that is credit. Um, and this is, this is bare bones the case. Go all the way back now here to 1650. <clears throat> so let's just set the stage for, for this. So to answer this question, how are we going to rebuild the United States? And how, where is it going to come from? Well, uh, this is a book that I found that people are, are, are uh, invited to look at. Um, it's a book called The Key of Wealth, an, or A New Way of, for Improving tr of Trade, uh, Lawful, Easy, and Safe. This is a book by some guy named William Potter, who I don't know that much about, except the fact that he was working with John Winthrop, Jr., the son of John Winthrop, uh, who was, had come here about 1626, a few years after the Plymouth landing, a few years, actually came in here in 1630, after the uh, uh, first group had come along and John Winthrop had been appointed the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, right? We left Europe to create a new uh, independent nation that would be free of Warfare, the religious warfare, 1492, 1648, terrible wars, uh, just complete murders, genocide of, of certain cultures through the uh, just nonstop war, the Spanish Inquisition, other Inquisitions. <clears throat> and what it really was was a, a lash out against the Renaissance culture that had rose after the Dark Ages. The Venetian banks, when they collapsed through all their speculation, even though apparently we, we were growing in technology in this period of uh, before the Dark Ages with windmills crushing things for flour, the, the one good use of windmills, um, that this, this, uh, growth of, this growth of technology led to, unfortunately, taken over again by the Venetian bankers, who, as people know, indebted all these kings and queens and everybody. And, and the, um, in the 1300s, there was the Black Plague and the Black Death. And in the aftermath of that, there was the, the first uh, growing of a true sovereign movement of intellectuals uh, since the real, really since the great, uh, the time of Athens, because all the old documents were refound. There was not the oligarchy breathing down your neck, and there was the, the Medici family in Florence, and all these Renaissance thinkers. Leonardo, uh, Leonardo came later, but Bruno Lesci, Donatello. And um, they built up this culture of science and technology and art. And one of the key guys who came out of this, the brothers of the Common Life School, where they wrote down everything in the books, and people were relearning and rewriting everything, uh, was Nicholas of Cusa. And he was at that school, and he became a, a patron of the brothers of the Common Life. But he was uh, someone who led a Renaissance movement to create representative government. And his works on that are very strange in 1439 because it's all about the Catholic Church and the popes and this. But what it's really trying to do is the church at that time to try to uh, create a, a relation where you'd have actual representative government in Europe. And you had then a reaction against this growth of, of technology. Uh, the good kings, there's a lot of bad kings, but the problem is not kings and queens. The problem is the empires that control the financial system. Some of the good kings were Louis XI and uh, 
than Henry VII. Now, the um, the uh, Venetian group, the Venetian oligarchy, kind of got smashed around around this time period. 1511, there was a concerted group with Henry V to come in and say, "Down with Venice! No more of your oligarchical usury and destruction of my people uh, by controlling everything and and just killing us, frankly." Uh, then, what happened was Venice plotted all these wars, moved up, they, they, they moved up to the Netherlands, and they created a, a new movement of anti-science, a guy named Paolo Sarpi. Uh, there's, lit there's literature on this on our website and things, but <clears throat> just to cut to the chase, Netherlands became the new speculative banking house. It became the big Venetian banking system in about 1560, 1580. And that system was growing and uh, was basically just it also destroyed the Renaissance movement that was up there at the University of Leiden. These guys, William Brewster, the people who founded our country at the Plymouth Bay, they were revolutionary intellectuals in, at Leiden University in the 1560s, 1580s, 1590, and they just took off, came here in 1620, and then they, were, they had uh, reinforcements by the, um, the, the Winthrops in 16. Uh, 15, uh, 1630, 1626. So to cut to the chase, we started building the Sagas Ironworks in 16, uh, um, 46. <clears throat> John Winthrop Jr., the son of John Winthrop, was a chemist. He was a uh, he studied iron. He was a great intellect, and um, he was somebody who. Uh, was looking, uh, getting all the mines and everything, and he was a real intellectual. And he um, was working with this guy, uh, William Potter. And William Potter puts together a book uh, in 1650, two years before they start issuing the pine tree shilling, which is the sovereign currency. They create a mine, they start emitting the currency. And 1652, uh, or 1650, he writes this book. He says he's been thinking about it for a while. And he's very humbly, he says, I can't believe that I was the one who figured this out. But he says um, <clears throat> that I should discover how all things which may be got for gold throughout this earth are obtainable in all respects as happily and effectually. Yea, and in a way, tending to as great improvement of trade, though with some difficulty. Yet in reference to the advantages thereof, so easy as may be admired, and may serve to demonstrate the vanity, not only of gold, but of all worldly wealth whatsoever. <clears throat> Admit thereof that several tradesmen of known and sufficient credit do cause a certain number of bills to be printed, and putting a value upon them do lend the said bills to each other upon no less security than if the same were so much ready money or gold out of the mine, and bend themselves jointly to make good the same according to the terms following. So he has this whole thing of we've got to increase trade, the problem is you've got people who are trying to trade goods and they have no means of transaction because we have no gold and silver. So how do we accelerate the process of trade? How could you get people, if they had money, to quickly move it around hands to accelerate uh, and increase productivity and, and not have people hoarding up their money but allow people to, although they don't have any more gold, they're multiplying their wealth by the speed of circulation. So he has a whole thing on that. Uh, and he's basically trying to get an agreement of credit bills amongst trades, tradesmen and merchants, to create an association that would then lend them out, basically like a bank. Um, <clears throat> so I haven't looked at all this thing, but Governor John Winthrop, he comes out with, uh, in 1663, with um, some proposals concerning a way of trade and banks without money. So what happened is there was <coughs> sagas are uh, the uh, pine tree shilling sovereign currency sometime around this 7, 1670. The king of England kind of came down and said, "You guys got to stop this sovereign currency nonsense." <laughs> uh, and and he and he said, "No more currency." So they kept printing the currency with the date 1652 on it to say, "No, no, no, really, we just printed it back then." 
Uh, so it would greatly advance commerce and other public concern for the benefit of the poor and the rich in Great Britain and the good of these plantations. He, so he says, to the great advance of trade, settlement of such a bank as may answer all those ends that are attained in other parts of the world by banks of ready money. So John Winthrop, however, there's no record of his speech. I, 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 it seems to have been lost. He presented it to the Royal Society. He made a copy for himself, but it's not clear. But it's probably the case that he was working off of this guy's book because uh, the following year, there's a guy who's also working with John Winthrop, 1664, a guy named John Woodbridge, and he also looks at the a lack of adequate medium of exchange, the deplorable condition, and he directly took William Potter's book and uh, came up with a means of transacting business without money and <clears throat> made a proposal to the colony in 1667. And uh, this was what was called the fund. Um, So 1667 and then 1671, they started an experiment of a fund of people using credit bills. And it's almost word for word, uh, this, a, group of, a group of these guys agree to use credit notes. And um, <clears throat> so basically not having to uh, use any gold and silver, just transferring credit through a joint fund without gold. And he says that uh, we started to pass bills to make an experiment which had passed the scrutiny of above 30 years. So 30 years from 1650 to 1681, when they finally then uh, started to do it, uh, is probably this same guy's book. So that was going on for a while. And then 1681, 83, finally you get the son of John Winthrop Jr. So Waite Winthrop, the grandson of John Winthrop, comes out with, uh, uh, along with John Blackwell, who's some, he ends up being the governor of Pennsylvania. But the point is that you get a group of guys, um, all of whom become instrumental in the following years of overthrowing the colonial diktat of Edmund Andros, who was an appointed royal governor of Massachusetts, who came in in 1686, and basically just did all these terrible things of shutting down uh, the economy, no more sovereignty, you can't do this. And he, <clears throat> he was booted out uh, in 1689 when there was a, the Glorious Revolution, which is not so glorious in England. Uh, but who was instrumental in overthrowing Edmund Andros? Cotton Mather, Adam Winthrop, the grandson of uh, this guy here, Adam Winthrop. <coughs> um, Waite Winthrop, another grandson of John Winthrop, Elijah Cook, all these guys' names are on this bank. It seems most necessary that something of this nature be set on foot for the present supply of the great scarcity of money here for carrying on the ordinary commerce amongst traders, who, unless speedily relieved by this medium, will in all probability be suddenly exposed to breaking and utter ruin considerable number of persons, some of each trade, calling and condition, agree voluntarily to receive as ready monies of and from each other and any persons in their ordinary dealings, bank bills of credit, become diffused by mutual consent, pass from one hand to another, and so have equal advantages with the current monies of the country attending them, to all who become satisfied to be of this society or agreement and that shall deal with them. So, so they get this, so it's almost word for word of William Potter. So, you know, they're all trying to figure out how do you maximize the existing uh, wealth and with potential wealth. So how do you, instead of having a bunch of people sitting on what they own, unable to transfer it to someone else because someone else doesn't have money in their hand, <clears throat> and be able to move, move things to going. And... Uh, so they, he get, they give some examples that, you know, a shopkeeper who owns a shop or a mine, uh, uh, someone who owns a mine or uh, uh, someone who owns a wool factory, you can just go to the bank and <clears throat> you just pledge your property, kind of like a mortgage, basically, 
but you just say we're going to you can mortgage your land and you'll get these credit, and then uh, you can tra pass it around with everybody else, and uh, say the the artificer, the husbandman, can now pay his rent, buy more cattle, the shopkeeper uh, can now do transactions with the merchant, um, the owner of a mine mortgages his property and can now pay his workmen with the credit. And then uh, they actually set it up so that when you start mining the metal, you could go bring it and put it in the bank and then get the credit for that. So you, you're basically just uh, creating this means of payment and create, getting, receiving credit bills for existing uh, property. And then people say, well, what if I don't have, what if I'm already in debt to someone that says, I only want gold and silver. I'm not going to receive these bills. I've already mortgaged my property to this money lender. Uh, what, do I, what do I do in that case? Like, well, you know, come down to the bank and we'll lend you that amount and we'll, you can end up transferring the property to us over time. They're basically kind of like a, it's almost like a, it's just, it's like a social security bank. Basically, someone says, well, I don't even have any property, but I could, I know I could be good. So you're allowing everybody to get credit who needs it. And they funny, they say, uh, and when you have their credit, use it in some honest calling or other just and necessary occasion, that with God's blessing on your lawful endeavors, you may reap the benefit proposed. So here in the language of the bank, you got uh, creator being <laughs> referenced. Uh, so, you know, this is, um, so it's uh, all these things. I say manufacturing builders, rope makers, sale, uh, li uh, sales, people who dye yarn, <clears throat> um, everything, now all these people have a way to exchange their goods. Uh, they say, the manufacturer benefits from the clearing house, always furnished with credit, so you have this house where everybody can bring their goods and get credit for the goods while they're sitting there, instead of just sitting with them at home, you can put them here, and then they'll sell it for you. They say they get money from the employment, enables them to buy up all necessaries of clothing, paying the debt. This helps the consumption of our own manufacturers and other goods imported. No man that hath will wherewith to buy uh, will go naked and hungry. This helps to civilize the ruder sort of people and encourages others to follow the example in industry and civility. So, again, everybody is now put into motion. And then this kind of, this quote makes the point. By the bank, the trade and wealth of this country will be established upon its own foundation and upon a medium or balance arising within itself, the lands and products of this country, and not upon the importation of gold or silver or the scarcity or plenty of them, or of anything else from foreign nations, which may be withheld, prohibited, or enhanced at their pleasures." Our own native commodities will thus become improved to a sufficiency for our own use, and thereby afford a comfortable subsistence to many ingenious and industrious persons among us, who know not at present how to subsist. And this will draw over more inhabitants and planters. It will not be in the power of any, by extortion or in depression, to make a prey of the necessitous. So, what is that? What is that but a sovereign bank, right? So we're going to declare sovereignty with this bank. Uh, we're going to have a means of, of currency, which has, we don't need gold and silver. We've got all this land. And if anybody wants to get a loan from this credit bank, you, you know, you just, you capitalize the thing based on just this pledge of your own existing property in the land. You don't need any so-called money. And so this is how they're explicit, and they were just going to do it. So unfortunately, that got crushed. When Andros came in, it didn't happen. He came in the year that it was going to happen. Uh, and so that's what happened. Now, in 1690, we had an expedition against the French, and it failed. Cotton Mather was sitting as the, um, he was sitting as the guy who was signing these bills of credit then that we were going to omit to pay the, the uh, soldiers who were, all thought they were going to get the booty from the French. And instead, there was no booty to be had. They came back. Uh, with nothing, and they had, we were totally bankrupt, because we went into debt to try to go uh, beat the French in this port. <clears throat> so, uh, 
John Blackwell, the guy who wrote the charter for this bank, and Cotton Mather, um, they both write some considerations on bills of credit. So, because people didn't want to take these bills, except people always would use bills of credit from merchant to merchant. So they're saying, well, hey, how come you won't accept the bills of the government? These are government bills that were used to pay these merchants until we can pay them later. And in the meantime, you've got to accept them as legal tender, right? And uh, so all these soldiers are sitting around with these bills, and everybody says, nah, give me a few extra. They're no good, you know. So, um, so that's the situation. And uh, John Blackwell, you know, he says, look, hey, we can have credit. And it will do as well if this credit we permit our friends to command the same useful things as if they had ready silver in their hands. Um, they who decry our bills of credit do sufficiently uh, do not sufficiently weigh the desperate circumstances of our country. We are surrounded by enemies. We cannot find the store of men to expose themselves. Anyway, but so the point is that uh, uh, he's saying, well, look, we're in, <clears throat> we're in great danger. We're surrounded by enemies. We just had a war that Edmund Andros orchestrated against us by uh, some of the Indians in the West, and then in France. So this is, uh, this is just their, their plan against us. But this is uh, trying to sit, tell people why these bills of credit should be used. But this is a very interesting uh, article by Cotton Mather. And you see the same kind of intellect of Cotton Mather, who himself he was a, a son of Increase Mather, who came here with Jim, John Winthrop. He was the guy who uh, came up with the inoculation for the colonies. He is you know, a scientist. He had the essays to do good, which inspired Benjamin Franklin. Basically, how do you create a citizen, a real citizen that's thinking about the whole colony and how to do good? So, but he's also a guy who, same as Ben Franklin, piercing intellect on this. Uh, he is very explicit. What is the security of your paper money less than the credit of the whole country? If the country's debts must be paid, whatever change of government shall come, then the country must make good the credit, or more taxes must still be raised till the public debts be answered. I say, the country, and not the gentlemen who administer the government, all the inhabitants of the land taken as one body are the principals who reap the benefits and must bear the burdens, and are the security in their public bonds. So you have, you know, an idea when you have a loan, you have the principal of the loan, and then you have the interest. So you borrow money, you have the principal. So he's saying the, the, the people themselves are the principals, mm -hmm. meaning we're, they're pledging, you know, they're the, that we're, we're loaning our people. So we're loaning our own population, and it, it's their commitment um, to make good on this. And then, then he says, right there in the next paragraph, he says, uh, money is but a counter or a measure of men's properties. As metal indeed is a commodity like all other things that are merchantable, but as money it is no more than what was said and had its orig original from a general ignorance of writing and arithmetic. And so he's just saying money is just a countermeasure of someone's property. But as a... Um, it had its original from a general ignorance of writing and arithmetic. So we came up with money back in the day because we didn't know how to just write things down. It's a countermeasure. You know, I owe you one, you owe me two. Let's balance the credits and the debts. Uh, you, you needed money, you know, it, you needed something where you could have a medium of exchange. But he says, now that these arts being commonly known may well discharge money from the conceded necessity thereof in human traffic. Oh, yeah, and Cotton Mather also makes the point. He says, you would accept this stuff if people were not thinking that we didn't have a government. He says, uh, if people's heads weren't idly bewizzled with conceits that we have no government, uh, which we can call our own, a consequence they would be loth to allow, though they cannot help it. If, <clears throat> if once we are reduced to Hobbes's, his state of nature, which is a state of war, um, I say, if such foolish conceits were not entertained, there would not be the least scruple in accepting your bills of current pay. So this belief that there's no government at all, so there's nothing behind these bills, and he says Thomas Hobbes. So there's a continuing crisis, though. That's 1691. And then um, Massachusetts Bay gets totally crushed, 
right? At this same time, Leibniz is in Europe, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz fighting with Queen Anne to try to uh, defeat the Venetians that had just taken over. He's working with the uh, Emperor of Austria, the Peter the Great. He's trying to organize nation state science, science movement. Uh, he tries to set up mines, all kinds of academies of the sciences. He's, he's looking at coal mining and everything. So we're getting crushed by William of Orange here in 1690, 1695. And then uh, Ben Franklin and others are moving out to Pennsylvania where things are not yet corrupted by the British. In the meantime, you have colonies like Rhode Island um, who are, who are uh, pushing that. To make up for great scarcity and want of a proper medium of exchange, the trade and commerce, which are the nerves and power of the government. Navigation is one main pillar on which this government is supported at present, and we never should have enjoyed this advantage had not the government emitted bills of credit to supply the merchants with a medium of exchange, always proportioned to the increase of their commerce. Without this, we should have been in a miserable condition unable to defend ourselves against an enemy or to assist our neighbors in times of danger. In short, if this colony be in any respect happy and flourishing, it is paper money and a right application of it that had rendered us so. In the same period you have uh, 1716, you have authors, some considerations upon several sorts of banks. And um, they're talking about also, lending large sums upon good security without interest for years to build bridges, to build a canal. You say, hey, look, we got all this iron, iron ore, plenty of wood. Uh, we should set up, uh, we should set up uh, iron works. So let's advance considerably in bills, uh, either by a loan or a gift, to undertake to set up the finery. He makes another good point. He says, uh, we need nails. If the country should give or lend a competent sum to any that shall procure workmen to bring a mill into effect, we could supply nails for the country. So why doesn't the country give a loan? So why don't all of you in this room, right, you have the authority as a colony to give a loan as the government <clears throat> by simply these bills of credit. So. He says, nobody would set up this ironworks for by themselves. You couldn't do it uh, by yourself, but with the, um, say, oh, yeah. So you, you, we, there's no way any individual could do this. You, it had to be a big project, right? This is the old infrastructure, need of infrastructure projects. So he said, this one article of ironworks, which might be set up for a few hundreds, would soon save the country some thousands in a year. <clears throat> so anyway, that's the kind of stuff that people are pushing. Again, 1720, things are still bad. We need trade, right? It goes all the way back to William Potter, John Winthrop. We need, uh, they say, uh, the great want of a medium of trade at present called for. Besides the gain proposed, it is is it not the glory and duty of authority to supply the province and uphold civil credit, without which trade must need die? So, you know, this is the, uh, this is the whole thing. I mean, you can't even ask for credit today. The empire is completely taken over, right? They've negated the Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. Here back then, people said, we got things to do. Well, let's admit some credit. Today, no, one's gonna, no one says to the government, let's admit credit. That's a fundamental problem. Everybody says, well, you know, Elizabeth Warren, for instance, here in Massachusetts, she says, let's uh, lower the interest rate for, for uh, kids in school, right? Well, that's good. But why don't we admit some credit for something we need to build? You're saying that we should just bail out everybody like the banks. Why don't we pick some winners and losers? Right? <laughs> Let's pick some winners and losers. I want this to win. We need to build this. Uh, and we just invest in it. And then you, you emit the credit for it. 
through whatever, how it means you want to do it. <clears throat> we got this plan right here. Here's one way to do it. Um, and then you, you build it up. And we, could, we, we could easily do this thing. The issue is uh, it's not the King of England anymore outlawing. It's Wall Street and London says you can't do it. And the philosophy is against it. And today, even the desire to do it is gone because so many people are green. They don't want to build anything that's going to take serious investment. <clears throat> so, I'm doing the best I can here with this throat. This is, I, don't know, I don't know what the problem is. Um, so, again, 1720, this is very, you know, 200,000, we need 6% interest. We need, uh, we need to build flat. Uh, this is a very interesting idea. We're going to have a bank emit loans out bills of credit to people. How do you pay the interest on the loan? You come to the bank and deposit your hemp, flax, fish, oil, whalebone, and other articles that would prevent uh, export, uh, it would prevent more imports. The produce received would be stored and then sold for gold and silver to merchants and then lodged in the treasury to pay off the interest that you own on the bills. So, you know, it's, it's all, it's, it's not mechanical, it's the intent uh, and why, why can the government do this kind of thing? You say, well, who gives the authority to just, wh why can't you just give me the money, right? Why can this government, why does this government want a bank that's going to lend? I, I got that from a congressional office a couple weeks ago. Well, because the government has the authority because it's, we don't live in a society of individuals, right? It's, it's a charter of Massachusetts Bay came over and it was, a government, it was a government, a nation state. It wasn't a bunch of individuals that were sitting around and said, well, you, you're, this is a government thing. I'm not going to accept your bills. You know, what authority do you have? And, uh, you know, so th this is the whole fight of the, the empire wants you to think of individuals, class warfare, blah, blah, blah. But it's really about <clears throat> um, the nation state and the fact that you don't have any individual rights outside of the nation state. They don't exist. The, we had to fight tooth and nail to get individual rights that were supplied by Massachusetts Bay, that were supplied by you know, the men of the essays to do good. And then um, this whole period of these colonies taking responsibility for their people, emitting these bills of credit in different periods. Um, so without, without the uh, nation state, you don't have individual rights. Now, Karl Marx, uh, for example, and these other these uh, <clears throat> distractions from the fight between empire and the nation state come in and say, you know, well, it's class warfare. It's the rich versus the poor. It's the plebeians versus the bourgeois, right? Well, actually, it's not, because if there wasn't a nation state, you'd just all be peasants, right? It's all peasants. And that's really what it is. It's feudalism versus sovereign nation states. The feudalism of the oligarchy says no new wealth. We have gold and silver. Whoever's got the wealth, gold and silver, we're going to create. We're going to control things, versus creating new wealth. And if the nation states want to actually create new wealth. Well, that's why you need a credit system, because a credit system is how you create the new wealth, right? You're basically just putting, you're, you're pledging to build something. And a lot, of the, a lot of the farmers in the United States, actually, around in Virginia, Jeffersonians, and so forth, and some places that had bad experiences with bills of credit, were very fixated on the ground, right? This is what I can feel, so I can touch. I don't really need credit, because I just sell my goods to this merchant. I don't know where the heck he comes from, but he just comes, and he buys my stuff, and he gives me gold and silver. And... Um, they were confused by how new wealth was being created by trade. But it, so it was actually the merchants and the businessmen that were the ones really who were trying to get this, this, a lot of this credit. They were the movers of this. And of course, that's just one characterization of it. It was really the, the people trying to move the whole colony forward. <clears throat> but that's what credit really is all about. So Ben Franklin comes in 1729. So you can see this little continuity here. Because this is when... Uh, a new governor comes in Massachusetts Bay, Governor Belker, who comes in and says, hey, no more bills of credit, 1730. 
Um, so he's writing right before this uh, takeover by the British. <clears throat> and he says, I cannot think the interest of England to oppose us in making as great a sum of paper or money here as we who are the best judges of our own necessities find convenient. Um, and then he says, uh, if they were to, I, would, I should think the government at home had some reasons for discouraging and impoverishing this province, which we are not acquainted with. Um, so I already read this other quote by Ben Franklin. But Ben Franklin's whole thing is basically repeating the argument what you saw before, but with a very scientific precision. That the measure of value should be labor, not gold and silver. That the measure of value of your country should not be how much gold and silver you have, but how much labor you have. Because if you can make a bushel of corn, he says, uh, so he, first he just reviews, um, you know, people always wanted to use gold and silver, but the problem is that gold and silver changes in value as you get more or less of it. So I think we should fix on something else, more proper to be made a measure of values, and this I take to be labor. By labor may the value of silver be measured as well as other things. So if you have two guys, you see, he takes six months, how much corn can you make? The other guy, how much, how much gold can I mine and put into pieces of, uh, how much gold can I mine and have as gold bullion? So that much corn should be equal to that much silver. So if I could make two ounces of silver in a time that you could make these eight bushels, well then, you know, <clears throat> two ounces of silver equals eight bushels of corn. Well, now, if I find a closer mine, and I can make four ounces of silver in the same time that this other guy makes eight bushels of corn, well, now, that corn is actually uh, cheaper, right? I'm sorry, it's more expensive. Uh, because now, I have, now it's four, four silver pieces in eight bushels of corn. So he says, thus, the riches of a country are to be valued by the quantity of labor its inhabitants are able to purchase and not by the silver and gold they possess. <clears throat> and he goes through a very rigorous argument. And there was a guy at the time who, uh, who says that Ben Franklin, unlike some of the other colonies, that they emitted bills of credit willy-nilly. Because this, some of the quotes I read were, were good. Some of them, it didn't always go so well. They kept emitting more bills of credit and uh, you get depreciation in the currency <clears throat> some cases. Uh, Thomas Poundwall, who was the governor of Massachusetts, at one point he said, there never was a wiser or better measure, never one better calculated to serve the uses of an increasing country more steadily pursued or more faithfully executed than Ben Franklin's paper money. By providing any act that payment be made either in those bills or in any other bills made current by any act of the legislature, that the interest as it is received may be again admitted and discharged, whereby circulating it returns into the hands of the borrowers and becomes part of their future payments. Um, and thus it is likely there will not be any difficulty for one of bills to pay the office. They are hereby kept from rising above their first value. So he has, a, he has a real argument of why this is going to work and why you're never going to get a big depreciation of the bills. Um, and uh, it's why, it's why uh, it worked better in that province than any other place. So you can see he's got a particular intellect of the thing. I don't, have, I don't want to have time to go through all of it. But what was that from? That's uh, from his uh, A Modest Inquiry into the necessity of, a pa of paper money. The, um, yeah, I think that's the title of it, right? The necessity of, of paper money. So, yeah, so he has a whole thing about the money as currency versus money as bullion, which is just the stuff in the ground. Uh, a very long argument. But the point is, after he writes this, Lord Belker comes in, and he comes into Boston in 1730, and he says that we are going to check the emissions 
of bills of public credit. Um, so other people try to then create bills of credit that are said this is equal to so many ounces of silver and we'll pay you the silver back later. Basically trying to make them so you could redeem them, redeem the notes for silver rather than just saying this is equal to money as a legal tender. So the issue is, right, the colony says we're going to emit these bills to pay people for something. Then when you want to pay your taxes, you can just use the bills. So you're basically just creating uh, a money supply in that way. Or the loan office loans the money to someone to build something. So those are the two different ways you can see. And then there's this other funny way with people paying interest in flax and whale bones. Yeah. Um, so Lord Governor Belker uh, keeps pushing down the bills of credit, uh, but it wasn't it wasn't working that well. Um, he's trying to ro carry out these royal instructions to reduce bills of public credit. So then Rhode Island just prints money like crazy, and Connecticut, and so everybody in Massachusetts is using Rhode Island and Connecticut bills of credit because they don't have any. And Ro Lord Belker is sitting there, you know, this isn't working. Um, but they still couldn't use that to pay their taxes and so forth. So the public opinion in 1739, the Massachusetts Assembly, called for any schemes or proposals from any persons, whomever, for furnishing a further medium of trade in such a way and manner as the value thereof might be maintained. So the value is fluctuating up and down, up and down. The question was how to create a stable medium of value. <clears throat> so the guy earlier in 1720, John Coleman, puts forward a plan for a land bank in 1740. So 1740, they come up with a land bank, bills that would be payable 20 years after the date, um, might be redeemed in produce or manufacturers enumerated in the scheme of the bank. And uh, the subscribers would simply agree to borrow from the company the amount of how much they, so they say, well, I'm going to, I want to pledge my property to be a subscriber of the bank. I have a hundred, you know, pounds of property. I want to pledge that to be a subscriber of the bank, so I'll make interest as part of the people who are the, subscriber, uh, the subscribers to the bank. You know, when you subscribe, you own the capital. It's not just making a deposit. So those people will receive the amount and can now go in business. It's the same old thing all the way back to John Winther. You have some land, a bunch of people get together, they pledge their land for the amount that is worth in these bills, right? So you have all these people in Massachusetts with all this land, factories and so forth, and they can't pay each other with anything because there's no accepted medium of exchange. I mean, they don't have any money. There was nowhere you could go to sell your land for gold and silver. So they said, well, what are we, what are we gonna do? So this is the whole idea of, of merchants were all sitting around trying to, they, were all, they would all loan each other their gold they had. Or they would say, you gotta pay me later on credit. You know, and then, uh, so every, Everything, they would pool their the gold that they had together. they do little quasi-banks. But it was all kind of hit and miss, and it was completely inefficient, and so it slowed down the ability of trade. And Robert Morris will talk about this a little bit later. So the land bank got totally crushed by Lord Belker. It didn't go. The axe comes down. And then in 1741, Jonathan, uh, Lord, uh, Lord Jonathan Belker, uh, he extended the, uh, the uh, Bubble Act of 1720. Everybody hear of the John Law Bubble? You can look it up. Washington Irving has a description of it. But yeah, the, the, the big uh, bubble of, of based on land in America <clears throat> that blew up, there was a, an act, a Bubble Act of Congress in 1720, or the, the Parliament. So they said, we're going to extend that to you. This land bank you guys are talking about, all your bills of credit in America, these are all going to be bubbles, right? which they weren't, because they weren't speculation. It's like the way Wall Street's destroying the credit system today. Credit, they're giving credit a bad name, right? They're saying, oh, credit? What do you mean credit? You talk to people, you say, well, you, why do you want credit? Well, 
there's different kinds of credit, again. And they were destroying, they were trying to impose the, the bad view of just speculative profit onto what is valid actual credit, which means the commitment to make good on something real. There's the, uh, the, the credit of trying to make good on your gambling debts. That's, that's different. If I get lucky, credit is not real credit. <laughs> Neither, you know, neither is a, the credit card when you're going to be sure not to be able to get a job. So, um, so then they uh, did this, and it caused some vocal uproar. There was another act of parliament in seven. Uh, it, it didn't really work that well because people kept issuing them for administration and, and emergencies. And then they put the act to, quote, forbid any paper bills or bills of credit be created or issued under any pretense whatsoever, 1751. So Ben Franklin is going to Congress or Parliament. He said, "You guys gotta, you guys gotta stop this. I warn you. I warn you." And um, he says, "Colonial legislatures should be empowered to issue any amount of money required for revenue, business, agriculture, lent on collateral because security, deficient, guarded against taxes, and interest on the loans to be used in meeting current expenses." So finally, in 1764, or. Uh, um, Congress, uh, Parliament actually said no. Act to prevent paper bills of credit hereafter to be issued in any of His Majesty's colonies or plantations from being declared to be a legal tender in payments of money. So 1773, the Parliament said, yeah, 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 you can have your paper money. But it was way too late by then, right? And so in the Declaration of Independence, the list of grievances, 1776, doesn't talk about interference in paper money. It talks about a lot of other stuff. Maybe it's because they had reversed it in 1773. But it was a big deal. So what did we do? The Congress of the United States emitted the Continental Bills. Now, this is a much harangued thing in, in populist writings all the time, both good and bad. Right? The people who love greenbacks today say, we just got to emit Continental Bills. Well, the problem was is that the Continental Bills that we then emitted to get us through the war, which we needed to emit, were not done by a government. Right? All these other colonies were done by a government. The government could collect the taxes and, and make good upon the credit, as Ben Franklin just said, right? That's what you have to do. <clears throat> and so Ben Franklin pretty much just said the bills of credit of the Continental Congress were just a tax on the people. And they kept getting less and less and less value because everybody knew there was nothing behind the bills. There was no organized function of, of bringing them out of circulation, putting new ones in, making good by collecting taxes of the people um, things like that. The Continental Congress. But the point is that the Continental Congress wasn't really a government. That's what the Constitution made the U.S. Congress finally a government, right? The Articles of Confederation made them kind of a, we'll, we'll give you, we'll kind of let you be a government, but you're not our government, you know? So the Continental Congress was a government in spirit, but it really wasn't so it wasn't fully set up. I mean, it, it didn't really have the power. So Robert Morris is sitting there as appointed uh, financier of the Continental Congress. And he's, um, he's just, he can't collect any taxes from any state. States will not give the Congress anything. So all they, they were borrowing money from Europe for the war. They were not getting money from the citizens to pay for anything here in the United States. So the, uh, the Continental Congress was basically just, it, it was an act of, of, of faith. It worked, but then it just kept getting worse and worse. And the war lasted longer than they thought it would. So they, first they just said, accept these bills. Everybody put them around. This is, this is the co Congress's bills. And so people did it for a while, but then it just kind of kept more and more and more depreciation. So... Um, Hamilton and Morris uh, are taking this whole problem up. Now, just before jumping into that, though, take a look at this quote by Hamilton, which is really great. It's his final report to Congress as Treasury Secretary, and he's reviewing. Um, he's, he's looking at the whole history, just as we did now, and he's saying uh, no man can you know, cast an eye without being convinced that the United States owe a great deal in fostering influence of credit, their present mature growth. 
This has been a mixed nature, mercantile, public, foreign, and domestic. Credit abroad was the trunk of our mercantile credit, from which we issued ramifications that nourished all the parts of domestic labor and industry. The bills of credit emitted from time to time by the different local governments, which passed current and money, cooperated with that resource. Their, their united force, quickening the energies and bringing into action the capacities for improvement of a new country, was highly instrumental in accelerating its growth. So, so now, but to backtrack, Hamilton's sitting there with Morris as he's financier of the Continental Congress. He's now building the government that will equal those bills of credit. So if you have a nation as a whole that uses a credit system like these bills of credit that Mather and Franklin and the Winthrops and everybody was using for those, uh, this review, the, uh, he's now building the government. So it's no coincidence, it's not accidental that the, the ability to have a full nation state credit system is coming is come into existence with the Constitution because it's this it was this challenge of how do you scientifically direct the intentions of a whole people uh, together as one and how do you how do you admit how do you basically admit the credit of the intention of the whole people to accomplish something and with the Continental Congress itself that wasn't that intention wasn't there so you couldn't have you couldn't just set up a credit system based on the Articles of Confederation. It didn't work. You had to have a, a single unified government with the power to do it. Um, so what happens is Hamilton says, you guys are, have lost the spirit of 1776. 1776 declaration says, we have all the power necessary uh, as that free and independence may of right do. Right? To have all the powers to do all these things that free and independent states might do well do. Well, if you're in a free and independent state, you've got to have the powers of your economy. Regulation of trade, commerce between the states, uh, the ability to um, what's the other one? Pay, uh, pay the debts, the ability to uh, coin money, oh, collect taxes, yeah. So it's all these, all these powers of the government. Um, and Hamilton writes, the fundamental defect is a want of power in Congress. And he's writing these letters in the middle of the war, seeing the complete depreciation of the currency due to a want of confidence of the Union. The Congress has been too much readiness to make concessions of the powers implied in his trust. We ought, therefore, not only to strain every nerve for complying of the requisitions to render the present campaign as decisive as possible, but we ought, without delay, to enlarge the powers of Congress. Every plan of which this is not the foundation will be illusory. The separate exertions of the states will never suffice. Nothing but a well-proportioned exertion of the resources of the whole under the direction of the Common Council, with power sufficient to give efficacy to their resolutions can preserve us from being a conquered people now, nor can make us a happy people thereafter. Uh, he says, it is by introducing order into our finances, not uh, by restoring public credit, not by winning battles, that we are finally to gain our object. It is by putting ourselves into a condition to continue the war, not by temporary violent and unnatural efforts, that we shall in reality bring it to a speedy and most successful one. So here's Hamilton writing to Morris in 1781 uh, that it's really going to be restoring the public credit, which is be not only how we're going to win the war, but how we're going to win the nation overall. And in fact, it was this, uh, this act that allowed us to win the war. So if you can't commit yourself to anything and the re to the resources as a whole, I, just, I point that out again. This one here. Nothing but a well-proportioned exertion of the resources of the whole under a direct and common council. So that's really what the credit system is, right? The, it's the unification toward a single intention. I mean, if we're going to build nuclear power plants in this country, 
and we're going to build a national and continental drought and flood control system, expand our farming. I mean, we're going to have to have a single intent. Because if you look at it like a physical system, you can't just willy-nilly throw a bunch of people over here, build this dam, uh, build this power plant, and who's directing the process to make sure that it's achieved in a certain amount of time? Do, how are you allocating your resources? Uh, how are you going to make sure that it, 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 it's actually going to come online in the time scale that you need it to so that you, the, you know, the power that you've allocated for, it's going to give you something back. It's like right now, you're going to have to allocate real scare, scarce resources of our power grid into something that's going to have to produce more than to put into it. So <clears throat> you need that kind of single intention, which is the Constitution. You know, and today, uh, we really just, there's a little bit of a tangent here, we really don't have a country. Because without a credit system, there is no United States. And the, the United States was set, founded to set this system up, the functioning system of a unification of the resources of the people as a whole with the financial system. And the fact that Wall Street has just cut off all uh, courage uh, of any, of any uh, leading government figure to commit themselves to any future state of economy has just canceled the Constitution. That's the key part of the Constitution. So Hamilton writes to Morris that what we really need to do is uh, set up a system where we can unite the resources of the whole in the sense of the merchants, the, the men of commerce, the men of industry who have capital in the sense of a factory, and unite that with the currency. Right now, the currency is just fiat, uh, basically a money currency in the sense that it was just paper money, but in the, not in the sense that it had credit. So it wasn't a credit currency, even though it was a paper money. So you can have a paper money that's credit, and you can have a paper money that's you know, European Union euros. So, uh, so but then how are you going to get these guys to lend their money to the government to get us through the war when they can make more money in trade? So he says, well, let's do this. Let's, we'll, we'll have them pool their money together in a massive credit with the government's pledge to make good on all these bills outstanding. And they'll make interest on the fact that this credit, massive credit, will be lent for profitable things. So essentially a bank. Uh, taking the loan office concept of Ben Franklin and just ratcheting it up a notch to go back to John Winthrop, right? So you, 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 you say, instead of just loan officers sitting on bills of credit and, and some money and loaning it out to people and then accepting it back for taxes and things, um, you're going to incorporate them uh, into a company and you're going to allow them to put in their own wealth in addition to the government's credit. So now you have a public and private system. And that means that the currency that goes in circulation is going in circulation for specific things through the loan office, or now in this case, the bank. So it's not just uh, put in for anything, but it's for these specific things by through the bank itself being all over the country and not just the government uh, doing it. A plan must be devised, which by incorporating their means together and uniting them with those of the public, will, on the foundation of that incorporation and union, erect a mass of credit that will supply the defect of moneyed capital and answer all the purposes of cash. A plan which will offer adventurers immediate advantages analogous to those they receive by employing their money in trade, and eventually greater advantages a plan which will give them the greatest security the nature of the case will admit for what they lend, and which will not only advance their own interest and secure the independence of their country, but in its progress have the most beneficial influence upon its future commerce, and be a source of national strength and wealth. I mean the institution of a national bank. So, uh, he says it's going to promote commerce, by furnishing a more extensive medium, right? This goes all the way back. It's the whole thing. You need a more extensive medium, as we see from 1650. Uh, so industry has increased. Commodities are multiplied. Agriculture and manufacturers flourish. And herein consists the true wealth of the state. 
And that was Hamilton's clear concept all along, right? Hamilton uh, wrote the essay on manufacturers to Congress where he really said, Adam Smith's view of, of capital as wealth is, is baloney. It's not capital and labor. It's the productive powers of labor. That's the measure of capital. As we increase technology through discoveries, that changes things. And it changes all the values of everything else. Yeah, converting what is so produced into a real and efficacious instrument of trade. It is by national bank alone that we can find the ingredients for a wholesome, solid, and beneficial paper credit. See, you know, the other paper was no good. A national debt, as it is not excessive, will be to us a national blessing. It will be a powerful cement of our union. It will also create a necessity for keeping up taxation to a degree, which will be a spur to industry. So here's the deal. Continental Congress is now going to have the powers to tax. Why? Because all the states are going to go into debt to this bank for the loans. So this bank, which we have all this outstanding debt for the war and everything, this bank uh, will be, which it will be capitalized by the pledge of the government. We get a loan from France for it, but also just uh, the pledge of the government. And his plan, his ha plan was to actually make it a capital of $200 million, which was <laughs> all of the continental bills of, of the credit, of continental co bills of, of the Congress. But the point is that this was, he was going to tie all the states together with this plan. So this is before the Constitution. This is 1781. All the states are willy-nilly, won't pay taxes, fighting with each other, and all the states instead, through this plan, will be unified because they're all, they'll have a national debt now. They're not I got my debt, he's got his, so I can't afford anything for him. And this is the big thing between Pennsylvania and Rhode Island in the Constitutional Convention, that Pennsylvania had always paid its, its debt to the, to the national government, and all these other states weren't paying anything. So they said, well, why should I pay, why should I help out any of these colonies? So this is uniting them all together by creating a national debt, and the national debt, therefore, would be a blessing by cementing the country together. So here's the guys uh, who you should know about. You have the team of Winthrop's and Mathers, and then the next real big team that you get is these guys, Hamilton and the Philadelphia crew. Um, so, so this bank, let me just say before getting into that picture, so this bank was uh, Robert Morris said, without the establishment of this bank, of the National Bank, the business of the Department of Finance could not have been performed through the war. We won Yorktown in 1781, but we didn't actually get a peace treaty with Britain until 1783. They would have crushed us in the interim with our collapse with the financial system. It would have been nothing, and the, all of our creditors would have said, you guys are finished. I don't see any, I don't see any intention of you to act as a whole. You declared Declaration of Independence. You fought this war with Great Britain. But you're squabbling. You're, you're, you're destroying each other's economy and trade warfare. And so you know, we're just going to wait it out and reconquer you later. Instead, uh, this bank got rid of the depreciated continentals, circulated. Instead, there were the banknotes. <clears throat> so now uniting the bank with the interests of agri the currency with the interests of agriculture and industry through this credit bank uh, it got us certain ways, but we still didn't have those those you know those powers that he was talking about, right? Those nagging powers of Congress. So we had a, a bank that, for a time period, put us together as a unit unity. But very quickly, the uh, the Pennsylvania governor, all the uh, states said, we don't think the government has the power to incorporate this bank. Some of these people like that like did that. James Madison even though he changed his mind later. But uh, they said, you guys have to um, get your charter from us. So this bank, which was supposed to be a national bank, quickly became a state bank. So it wasn't, was, wasn't going to do the trick that we really needed to make good on this huge public debt that we had for the war. right? So this big public debt for the war, we had to still make good on that, the Liberty Debt, the Continental Bills of Congress. And the Continental Congress was sitting with it on its books. And Robert Morris is still sitting there. I can't get any taxes from anyone. Um, Robert Morris says, 
in 1781, to ask the end which it is proposed to answer by this institution, his, the bank, of a bank, is merely to call the public attention to the situation of our affairs. A depreciating paper currency has unhappily been the source of infinite private mischiefs, numberless frauds, and the greatest distress. So, you know, people selling land for dirt cheap, this is what they always did. They would expand, they contract the currency, and Ben Franklin talks about this in his paper, then the value of land goes way down because no one wants to go to a country where there's no currency and nothing's going on. There's no trade. And, uh, and, and poor people have to sell their land to get money to pay things with. Um, and he goes through other things on that. So then the, 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 uh, the real rich will then buy up the land for cheap. And then they like to get more emission of the currency later. So then the price of the land goes up and they can sell their land. So, um, you know, this is what this is what happened. These frauds he's talking about. So, he says, in the meantime, the exigencies of the U.S. require an anticipation of our revenues, while at the same time there is not such confidence established as will call out for that purpose the funds of individual citizens. So he basically gives up. Robert Moore says, "The heck with it! I I resign." And he was going to resign earlier, but he finally resigns. Because he said, I will not be the instrument of injustice to the people of the United States. If, these if, the, if we do not want to act like a country and we're going to just sit around and, and, uh, and let each other get screwed by all these debts, then I'm going to leave. It's because he couldn't collect taxes. There was no power of Congress to tell the states that you had to pay the tax because it wasn't in the Articles of Confederation. It was all... It was all just a, a nicey nice. Would you please? And they say no, we won't. And uh, they even they wouldn't even pay a five percent impulse tax on goods. So they wouldn't pay any tariffs. So nothing. They wouldn't submit to anything. So he says payments of debts may well be expensive, but it's infinitely more expensive to withhold the payment. The former is an expense of money, when money may be commanded to defray it. But the latter involves the destruction of that source from whence money can be derived, whence all other sources fail. That source, abundant, nay, almost inexhaustible, is public credit. So he says this is going to be totally destroyed. Uh, America is in need of credit. A due provision for the public debts would at once convert these debts into a real medium of commerce. So if you could, if you could, uh, a due provision, if you could provide to pay the public debts, now you'd have a currency. So simply the intention to make good on the debts, if you did that, you could convert all these certificates of debts that people are sitting around with into a currency. So that's what Hamilton does with, uh, once he achieves the powers of Congress. But this was the main reason for our friends from Philadelphia pushing the powers of Congress. These guys are the ones that a lot of people don't know about. And a lot of people who like to say gold, silver, the Constitution was, you know, all against bills of credit and everybody didn't like it. Well, here's this guy on the left, James Wilson. Uh, he is uh, the defense spokesman. He's a defense attorney for the Bank of North America. And people are saying it's unconstitutional, it's bad, it's bad. These are the merchants trying to produce a real industrial economy. And he got a bunch of, you know, nitwicks sitting out in the boondocks saying, we don't like the banks. They, not because, you know, because we're too far away from the bank to get a loan. Not because we're against banks. We don't benefit from this bank, right? And uh, there were other silly things. There was also a British agent who later uh, dedicated his house to Lord Shelburne of England. There's a whole other chapter of the story. Over here, going after the bank um, in 1785. James Wilson was a spokesman for that bank and came up with the implied powers argument, essentially, of Alexander Hamilton that, you know, the Constitution is a, is a set of powers, not of rules. It's a, it's, a set of, it's a set of what, not how. And uh, Nicholas Biddle's copy of that argument by Hamilton led to Justice Marshall's 1819 defense of the constitutionality of the National Bank. Well, James Wilson kind of, he started that thread with a paper called The Constitutionality of the Bank of North America in 1785. Well, he writes the whole Constitution. Sorry, guys, if anybody is on the, you know, is on the uh, literal Jeffersonian side of things. 
Uh, that's not the Constitution. He writes the first draft of the whole thing. You know, you got Robert Morris. We already saw him in this previous photo. And, of course, we know Ben Franklin. And then Gouverneur Morris, he writes the preamble, stylizes the whole Constitution with Hamilton. He's working with Robert Morris in this period when Robert Morris finally resigns. They both know the problem of not having powers of a government. So they're all for very strong powers of government. And, and they're for the credit system. They're all the guys who worked on setting up a currency that's based on future value, not based on hereditary wealth and gold and silver. So Hamilton says, a sound and settled state of the public funds, uh, a man possessed of the sum of them can embrace any scheme of business which is must confidence as if he were possessed in an equal sum of coin. So I mean, I'm kind of beating this drum you can see that since 1650, we don't want money. So the problem is that everybody says, well, what about the money? Well, arguably, you could say, well, today we don't have gold and silver. So what are you talking about? But it's true that cash is exactly the same concept that people had today. So today you have money. And you say, well, if you don't have money, how are you going to pay for it? What it really means is that you don't have the money up front. And that was what gold and silver was. It was just, do you have the money up front? And what happened is, gold and silver, by the choice of the people, as you can see from 1658 through on, had only always been the way in which Venice, the Netherlands, and then the Bank of England said, you have to uh, abide by our rules and restrict your growth accordingly. And in um, and while the Bank of England did, uh, did a lot of things with their paper money, in 1844, after Andrew Jackson and uh, Aaron Burr and, and all the British agents that were involved in that, which is the part two of this class, which will take place tomorrow, uh, what these guys did is, after they destroyed the credit system here and they accomplished what they wanted, they put through in the Parliament in England, 1844, the Specie Act, that said all the Bank of England notes had to be exactly equal to gold. So on the contrary, with the, this system, with the Hamilton system that he sets up by making good on this debt, the bank, it can circulate five times the amount of notes at the capital. And so what you're really just doing is it's not based on the existing wealth. It's just it's based on the intention to make good with the regulated powers of government. If you have the regulated powers of government, now you can control that system of credit. So it's not you're just leading it out to however anybody wants to do it. And oh my god, five times? Isn't that fractional reserve banking? And you know, you got this Mises Institute, which uh, I think Lyndon LaRouche correctly characterized as just a mental disease, where I mean, these guys wanted to bake gold and silver all day. Well, I'm sorry, but we just put the nail in the coffin that this country is founded on gold and silver, right? But then you go, you go to Lincoln's economists, and these guys all similarly to show nobody wanted to use gold and silver. Why? Because you can't. You can't. I mean, you can't. If you want to, if you're a farmer and a merchant, and you're, I mean, if you're out in the boondocks and you just kind of raise your crops and once in a while get paid, and you're not interested in the new advanced machinery and technology. Okay, fine, maybe so. But if you want to, uh, if you want to buy someone's goods before uh, you have the money to do so, and and then so you can make a product and then pay them back later, well, you can't use gold and silver because it's you have to have the money up front with gold and silver. So everybody chose to simply use this bills of exchange trade, and even the merchants did. You know, back in the, they always used it. 1600s, 1650s, I mean, they always use simply promises to pay, which were just notes on a piece of paper, I'll pay you later. But then, it's a different thing to say, I'll pay you later, not in gold and silver, but I'll pay you later in credit. So I'm going to pay you later by paying you later. Again, I'll keep doing it, and we'll just keep doing it, and we'll balance accounts, and we never need any money. How great is that? We just have a bank that balances the accounts, balances of payment, credits, and debts, and that is what 99% of all transactions in the U.S. economy were from, you know, 1790 all the way through to Andrew Jackson. 
and even after Andrew Jackson, is even this even Andrew Jackson's uh, Specie Resumption Act, or, or the uh, Sub-Treasury, which said the government's only going to deal with gold and silver. The people said, well, that's fine. You guys go deal with gold and silver. We're going to keep using these banks. <laughs> but, but they were completely unregulated. So they blew out. They keep blowing out, right? So the point is, it's you have regulation of the government fully, and you simply use this five, you know, five to one. Hamilton's was five to one. His, his bank was 10 million capital, and it was only uh, one-fourth part specie, and then the rest of it was all just this public debt, which ended up being five to one, because there was only two million in specie in it. And even some of that, he just kind of made it up uh, in order to uh, make the thing work. The thing was to have an intention to make, to increase the circulation for physical trade. And he actually increased the circulation by an order of magnitude by taking these worthless bills of, of certificates and making good on them with the intention of the government. So you had the 60 million of, of currency out there, certificates during the war that people were passing around that were, that were basically commitments to pay sometime in the future, U.S. government, we're going to win the war, right? <clears throat> or just continue outstanding of that process from 1783 to 1787, even after the war. Um, and those, those notes uh, were worse and worse. So he's, by committing to pay them, by using the powers of the government to control the investment of, into productivity and to use a bank which would allow the holders of those debts to now be subscribers, he took 10 million of that into the capital of this bank and then created a banking system where other people could use those evidences of debts as simply a medium exchange. They didn't really care about ever paying off the principal. They did, but it was more about creating a physical surplus. So Hamilton creates this physical surplus, uh, and his thing is always, um, you know, this national debt is a national blessing quote, right? Well, that, that quote, he, he clarifies what he means when he says later in his 1790 report that, uh, that no debt should ever be created without the means of its extinguishment connected to it. So, see, what Hamilton did is he didn't, there wasn't, he didn't have just a debt, and then he did something with the debt. He actually created the debt of the United States anew. So he had these existing monetary debts, which were simply certificates during the war people had that were never going to be paid. Domestic, that the Congress owed people state, that the state governments had their own debts, and then foreign, what we owed other people around the world. And he took all those together, and he said, we're going to assume them, we're going to borrow all of that debt. We're going to borrow the debt from you and reissue new debt, whether you're a foreign holder, a domestic holder, or a state government, and we're, and we're going to pay you interest on that, and it's going to be a single U.S. certificate. But in the same act of Congress that he, that he put those debts together, he channeled the future revenues of the country to make good on the debt. So it was a single act. You never have a self-evident object sitting over here, uh, you know, the way people think about just individuals in a, you're just an individual, it's a bunch of individuals uh, in that meaning of self-evident, where it's not just this independent object ex completely separate from everything else. It was, there was never a debt in that way. It's tied to the future that you're, uh, you're going to end up making good on. And in that sense, it's interesting that this is exactly uh, what Franklin Roosevelt, his conception of debt, how he, he put us into debt, and he says, debt, whether individual, corporate, or government, cannot be judged in a vacuum. It must be considered in light of earnings, assets, and credit standing. When the increase in the national debt is viewed against the background of what was accomplished by the growth of useful physical assets and of effective national earning power, and by the strengthening of the nation's credit and morale, there is no economic ground for anxiety so far as the national debt is concerned as to the nation's future. So, you know, it's a similar, that theme, and the similar theme, this view of debt, is what Nicholas Biddle revived, and it's really 
So what, this, what the Bank of the U.S. was then based on that Hamilton set up. So the debt is not monetary debt, it's credit debt. So it's, it's not bad debt. And, um, you know, there's a lot of these guys who actually think about that. They weren't, they weren't merchants. Uh, they weren't poor debtors. It's like people like to say, you know, oh, you're just a bunch of debtors. No, it was risky. Some of it was risky investments by merchants, but it was really the industrials. We're good. We have the right to go into debt, darn it. Don't you take away our right to go into debt. And I just like to rub that in because, I mean, think about that today. I mean, people are crazy about this stuff. <clears throat> so uh, this is what he did, public credit, people in agriculture, uh, again, right, a little less useful than gold. And then let me just hit, hit this as, the, as one of our concluding uh, pieces on this. So when Hamilton is leaving the Treasury, he's actually left. And now he's writing to Oliver Wolcott, the new Secretary of Treasury. This is before Gallatin comes in and screws it all up under Jefferson. Um, here he does something interesting. So everybody was all saying bills of credit are no good. The continental bills of credit were no good, so we don't want to do that anymore. And they probably thought they'd just get rid of them and have a bunch of state, state banks and, and gold and silver. But Hamilton, of course, did this completely different thing, right? He took the debt, he converted it into credit, and he increased the circulation and basically created the... the the ability to move the country forward, 1790, 1791, um, and so forth. But he now says to Oliver Wolcott, so you, you know, when you're collecting taxes, um, you know yourself how difficult and oppressive is the collection, even if taxes are very moderate in their amount, if there be a defective circulation. Aha, right? What do we come again? Defective circulation. Not enough means of payment. And he said, individual capitals, consequently facility of direct loans, is not very extensive in the US. The banks can only go a certain length and consequently must not be forced. The government will stand in need of large anticipation. So if we can't get a loan from this bank, I, for these and other reasons, I have come up to the conclusion that our treasury ought to raise up a circulation of its own. I mean by issuing a treasury notes payable, some on demand, others at different periods, from very short to con pretty considerable uh, at first, but having little time to run. So he's basically, he's, he's uh, anticipating what Abraham Lincoln did with the greenbacks later on, right? I mean, this is why this is very important. Again, just to reiterate, there's no way that we could ever revive this economy if, unless we implement this credit system plan. Because why? It's the only way it's ever worked. We've never had an industrialization of the U.S. that didn't depend on this credit system. In this way, exactly conscious of these facts. Right? You never, all these guys knew what I presented here today. Some of them, actually this Winthrop thing may have been, people didn't know about that, but I bet you they did. Uh, they all knew. I mean, uh, John Quincy Adams, diehard Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian, diehard Ben Franklin. I mean, it's, it's a continuous theme. And then Abraham Lincoln, the chief defender against Andrew Jackson and, and Van Buren of this system. And then same thing uh, with FDR, which we don't have time to go through today. But they all used a consciousness of how this system worked. And uh, so it's the only way it's ever worked. We have to reassert these powers of the government over the economy. Full, uh, no literal interpretations of the Constitution. We look at the meaning of the government, which is sovereign. The government cannot be nullified uh, to, to, to survive. And that's been the history of the U.S., more the authority of government versus the authority of gold and silver. And uh, I just want to come to my concluding argument here.
that you know this is what they're what, what they're doing now. You have Schäuble, the, the finance minister, I think, of Germany, who came out and said we have to return to 14th century Middle Age, uh, Dark Age banking, because the I, I'm not joking. I mean, he said we have to return to the 14th century before fractional reserve banking. Again, fractional reserve banking is coincident with nation state building. Uh, we've got to somehow get, get we've got to clarify that, that issue. It's not banking, though, per se, because it's not mechanical. Right? There's no mechanical solution uh, that works. The, nothing mechanical works. Right? It's not about a bank setting up the bank and that everything's going to be great. It's about the government deciding to protect the rights of citizens. And you protect the rights with the means to, uh, the means of, uh, to create the rights by having the right to go into debt, by having the right to increase your productivity, but the right to be productive. So you want to have, you want to have this, this kind of intention, this, this government coming in, taking charge, screw the bastards, Wall Street goes down, they go bust, that's Glass-Steagall. But, but the real point of Glass-Steagall is the government taking charge of the interests of the country. So what's the interest of the country? It's to set up this full industrial program with, using a, a, with controlling the whole financial system. So it's not about regulating an existing system. It's about crushing Glass-Steagall is the means to crush the existing financial system and to set up the new government system. So the government is going to come in like Roosevelt did. Roosevelt came in on the first day. He canceled the inauguration ball. He came in on March 3rd, 1933, and, and, and had the bank holiday. I think immediately when he got into the Oval Office, he sat down, he said, we're going to business. And, and he just shut these guys down. I mean, that was intention. And, and uh, so you, you have to just come in and... and set up a new government. So we're going to set up a new government that's going to be based on uh, the powers of, of Congress to develop the whole economy. And as we can see, so just to review, this is, uh, this is the fight. Are we going to give up our, our, our powers as we have? We've already given them up. We're not even a nation anymore at this point with this Dodd-Frank international uh, legislation. Uh, we don't have the, we do not have sovereign power over our financial system. We have people begging. No one is even thinking about uh, pushing this kind of plan in the Congress. They're, they're hardly even saying that we should kick Wall Street in the balls, even though Wall Street has sacrificed our firstborn children. Um, you know, you think that that would be at least, you know, uh, the appropriate action. <laughs> but we don't even have that. We, we don't have the credit because we don't have a commitment to live. As you can see with our population re reduction that's going on, that means that overall we don't have a commitment to the next generation. That is, means we have zero credit. So all these things we have to do at once. We have to get the commitment to the future, how we're going to get there, with this in master industrial plan, and then the commitment to a, a financial system that's simply a reflection uh, of that process. ...satisfied to be of this society, or agreement, and that shall deal with them. So, so they get this, so it's almost word for word of William Potter. So, you know, they're all trying to figure out how do you maximize the existing uh, wealth and with potential wealth. So how do you, instead of having a bunch of people sitting on what they own, unable to transfer it to someone else because someone else doesn't have money in their hand, <clears throat> and be able to move, move things to going. And uh, so they, he get, they give some examples that you know a shopkeeper who owns a shop or a mine, uh, uh, someone who owns a mine or a, a, someone who owns a wool factory, you can just go to the bank and <clears throat> you just pledge your property, kind of like a mortgage, basically. But they just say, we're gonna you can mortgage your land and you'll get these credit. And then uh, you can pass it around with everybody else. And uh, 
say the, the artificer, the husbandman, can now pay his rent, buy more cattle. The shopkeeper uh, can now do transactions with the merchant. Um, the owner of a mine mortgages his property and can now pay his workman with the credit. And then uh, they actually set it up so that when you start mining the metal, you could go bring it and put it in the bank and then get the credit for that. So you, you're basically just uh, creating this means of payment and create, getting receiving credit bills for existing uh, property. And then people say, well, what if I don't have, what if I'm already in debt to someone that says, I only want gold and silver, I'm not going to receive these bills, I've already mortgaged my property to this money lender, uh, what, do I, what do I do in that case? Like, well, you know, come down to the bank and we'll lend you that amount and we'll, you can end up transferring the property to us over time. They're basically kind of like a, it's almost like a, it's just, it's like a social security bank. Basically, someone says, well, I don't even have any property, but I could, I know I could be good. So you're allowing everybody to get credit who needs it. And they, funny, they say, uh, and when you have their credit, use it in some honest calling or other just and necessary occasion, that with God's blessing on your lawful endeavors, you may reap the benefit proposed. So... Here in the language of the bank, you got uh, creator being <laughs> referenced. Uh, so, you know, this is, um, so it's uh, all these things. I say manufacturing builders, rope makers, sale, uh, uh, sales, people who dye yarn. <clears throat> um, everything, now all these people have a way to exchange their goods. Uh, they say... The manufacturer benefits from the clearing house, always furnished with credit. So you have this house where everybody can bring their goods and get credit for the goods while they're sitting there. Instead of just sitting with them at home, you can put them here, and then they'll sell it for you. They say they get money from the employment, enables them to buy up all necessaries of clothing, paying the debt. This helps the consumption of our own manufacturers and other goods imported. No man that hath will wherewith to buy uh, <clears throat> will go naked and hungry. This helps to civilize the ruder sort of people and encourages others to follow the example and looking, uh, getting all the minds and everything. And he was a real intellectual, and he um, was working with this guy, uh, William Potter. And William Potter puts together a book uh, in 1650, two years before they start issuing the pine tree shilling, which is the sovereign currency. They create a mine. They start admitting the currency. And 1652 or 1650, he writes this book. He says he's been thinking about it for a while. And he's very humbly, he says, I can't believe that I was the one who figured this out. But he says um, <clears throat> that I should discover how all things which may be got for gold throughout this earth are obtainable in all respects as happily and effectually. Yea, and in a way, tendings to as great improvement of trade, though with some difficulty, Yet in reference to the advantages thereof, so easy as may be admired, and may serve to demonstrate the vanity, not only of gold, but of all worldly wealth whatsoever. <clears throat> Admit thereof that several tradesmen of known and sufficient credit do cause a certain number of bills to be printed, and putting a value upon them do lend the said bills to each other upon no less security than if the same were so much ready money or gold out of the mine, and bend themselves jointly to make good the same according to the terms following. So he has this whole thing of we've got to increase trade. The problem is you've got people who are trying to trade goods and they have no means of transaction because we have no gold and silver. So how do we accelerate the process of trade? How could you get people, if they had money, to quickly move it around hands to accelerate uh, and increase productivity and, and not have people hoarding up their money but allow people to, although they don't have any more gold, they're multiplying their wealth by the speed of circulation. So he has a whole thing on that. Uh, and he's basically trying to get an agreement of credit bills amongst trades, tradesmen and merchants, to create an association that would then lend them out, basically uh, like a bank. Um, <clears throat> so I haven't looked at all this thing, but Governor John Winthrop... He comes out with, uh, in 1663, with um, some proposals concerning a way of trade and banks without money. 
So what happened is there was <coughs> sagas are, are the uh, Heinz tree shilling sovereign currency sometime around this 7, 1670. The king of England kind of came down and said, you guys got to stop this sovereign currency nonsense. Uh, and, and, he, and he said, no more currency. So they kept printing the currency with the date 1652 on it to say, no, 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 really. We just printed it back then. Uh, so it would greatly advance commerce and other public concern for the benefit of the poor and the rich in Great Britain and the good of these plantations. He, so he says, to the great advance of trade, settlement of such a bank as may answer all those ends that are attained in other parts of the world by banks of ready money. So John Winthrop, however, there's no record of his speech. I, 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 it seems to have been lost. He presented it to the Royal Society. He made a copy for himself, but it's not clear. But it's probably the case that he was working off of this guy's book because So the whole question arises, how are we going to build a nationwide system of drought and flood control, complete re-innovation re of, our, of our power grid, uh, enough nuclear power plants to provide uh, efficient trans electricity, not only for current needs, but for a huge industrial uh, cement, copper, aluminum mills, uh, the new power plants, all the, the drilling, rolling, forging, canal digging, tunnel boring, drilling, uh, reservoir building, pumping, all of this. How, how are we going to get that much electricity? And how are you going to pay for it? Right? That's what everybody says to me in every single meeting uh, whenever you start to get into the good stuff. They say, I like the idea, but how are you going to pay for it? Um, I like the idea, but where are you going to get the money? Well, the whole thing is, it has nothing to do with money at all. Uh, and this country was not founded on money, and we don't need money. Uh, all we need is our own commitment to do the job. Another word for that is credit. Um, and this is, this is bare bones the case. Go all the way back now here to 1650. <clears throat> so let's just set the stage for for this. So to answer this question, how are we going to rebuild the United States and how, where is it going to come from? Well, uh, this is a book that I found that people are, are, are uh, invited to look at. Um, it's a book called The Key of Wealth, an, or A New Way of, for Improving of Trade, uh, Lawful, Easy, and Safe. This is a book by some guy named William Potter, who I don't know that much about, except the fact that he was working with John Winthrop, Jr., the son of John Winthrop, uh, who was, had come here about 1626, a few years after the Plymouth Landing. A few years, actually came in here in 1630, after the uh, uh, first group had come along and John Winthrop had been appointed the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. right? We left Europe to create a new uh, independent nation that would be free of warfare, the religious warfare, 1492 to 1648. Terrible wars, uh, just complete murders, genocide of, of certain cultures through the uh, just nonstop war, the Spanish Inquisition, other Inquisitions. <clears throat> and what it really was was a, a lash out against the Renaissance culture that had rose after the Dark Ages. The Venetian banks, when they collapsed through all their speculation, even though apparently we, we were growing in technology in this period of uh, before the Dark Ages with windmills crushing things for flour, the, the one good use of windmills, um, that this, this, uh, growth of, this growth of technology led to, unfortunately, taken over again by the Venetian bankers, who, as people know, indebted all these kings and queens and everybody and, and the... Um, in the 1300s, there was the Black Plague and the Black Death. And in the, uh, the following year, there's a guy who's also working with John Winthrop, 1664, a guy named John Woodbridge, and he also looks at the a lack of adequate medium of exchange, the deplorable condition, and he directly took William Potter's book and uh, 
came up with a means of transacting business without money and <clears throat> made a proposal to the colony in 1667. And uh, this was what was called the fund. Um, oh. So 1667 and then 1671, they started an experiment of a fund of people using credit bills. And it's almost word for word, uh, this, a, group of, a group of these guys agree to use credit notes. And um, <clears throat> so basically not having to uh, use any gold and silver, just transferring credit through a joint fund without gold. And he says that uh, we started to pass bills to make an experiment which had passed the scrutiny of above 30 years. So 30 years from 1650 to 1681, when they finally then uh, started to do it, uh, is probably this same guy's book. So that was going on for a while. And then 1681, 83, finally you get the son of John Winthrop Jr. So Wait Winthrop, the grandson of John Winthrop, comes out with... Uh, uh, along with John Blackwell, who's some, he ends up being the governor of Pennsylvania. But the point is that uh, you get a group of guys, um, all of whom become instrumental in the following years of overthrowing the colonial diktat of Edmund Andros, who was an appointed royal governor of Massachusetts, who came in in 1686 and basically just did all these terrible things of shutting down uh, the economy, no more sovereignty, you can't do this. And he, he was booted out uh, in 1689 when there was a, the Glorious Revolution, which is not so glorious in England. Uh, but who was instrumental in overthrowing Edmund Andros? Cotton Mather, Adam Winthrop, the grandson of uh, this guy here, Adam Winthrop. <coughs> um, Waite Winthrop, another grandson of John Winthrop. Elijah Cook, all these guys' names are on this bank. It seems most necessary that something of this nature be set on foot for the present supply of the great scarcity of money here for carrying on the ordinary commerce amongst traders who, unless speedily relieved by this medium, will in all probability be suddenly exposed to breaking and utter ruin. A considerable number of persons, some of each trade, calling and condition, agree voluntarily to receive as ready monies of and from each other, and any persons in their ordinary dealings, bank bills of credit, become diffused by mutual consent, pass from one hand to another, and so have equal advantages with the current monies of the country attending them, to all who become sad. Aftermath of that, there was the, the first uh, growing of a true sovereign movement of intellectuals uh, since the real, really since the great uh, the time of Athens, because all the old documents were refound, there was not the oligarchy breathing down your neck, and there was the, the Medici family in Florence, and all these Renaissance thinkers. Leonardo, uh, Leonardo came later, but Bruno Lesci, Donatello, and um, <clears throat> they built up this culture of science and technology and art. And one of the key guys who came out of this, the brothers of the Common Life School, where they wrote down everything in the books and people were relearning and rewriting everything, uh, was Nicholas of Cusa. And he was at that school, and he became a, a patron of the Brothers of the Common Life. But he was uh, someone who led a Renaissance movement to create representative government. And his works on that are very strange in 1439, because it's all about the Catholic Church and the popes and this. But what it's really trying to do is the church at that time to try to uh, create a, a relation where you'd have actual representative government in Europe. And you had then a reaction against this growth of, of technology. Uh, the good kings, there's a lot of bad kings, but the problem is not kings and queens. The problem is the empires that control the financial system. Some of the good kings were Louis XI and uh, then Henry VII. Now, the... Um, the uh, Venetian group, the Venetian oligarchy kind of got smashed around, around this time period. 1511, there was a concerted group with Henry V to come in and say, down with Venice, 
no more of your oligarchical usury and destruction of my people uh, by controlling everything and, and just killing us, frankly. Uh, then what happened was Venice plotted all these wars, moved up, they, they, they moved up to the Netherlands, and they created a, a new movement of anti-science, a guy named Paulo Sarpi. Uh, there's, lit there's literature on this on our website and things, but <clears throat> just to cut to the chase, Netherlands became the new speculative banking house. It became the big Venetian banking system in about 1560, 1580. And that system was growing and uh, was basically just it also destroyed the Renaissance movement that was up there at the University of Leiden. These guys, William Brewster, the people who founded our country at the Plymouth Bay, they were revolutionary intellectuals in, at Leiden University in the 1560s, 1580s, 1590, and they just took off, came here in 1620, and then they, were, they had uh, reinforcements by the, um, the, the Winthrops in 1650. Uh, 1630, 1626. So to cut to the chase, we started building the Sagas Ironworks in 16, uh, um, 46. <clears throat> John Winthrop Jr., the son of John Winthrop, was a chemist. He was a uh, he studied iron. He was a great intellect, and um, he was somebody who. Um, 